Hello, everyone. I'm Doug Menke. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Genetics and director of UGA's Developmental Biology Alliance. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Boyd Lecture. Um, the George H. Boyd Distinguished Lecture Series honors the former dean of the UGA Graduate School, uh, who was known for his commitment to both education and research. Uh, and during his 33 years at UGA, Dr. Boyd served as head of the zoology department, which is now the cellular biology department. He also served as chairman of the biological sciences division, dean of the graduate school and director of general research. This special lecture series is supported by the Office of Research and the William S. and Elizabeth K. Boyd Foundation. And today's Boyd lecture is co-hosted by uh, the Department of Genetics, the Department of Cellular Biology, and the Developmental Biology Alliance. Our 2021 Boyd lecturer is Dr. Neil Shubin. Dr. Shubin studies major anatomical transitions that have occurred during vertebrate evolution. And he and his research team are best known for the discovery of ancient fossil fish. Uh, that reveal transitional anatomies that occurred during evolution of terrestrial animals. Um, but really interestingly, beyond his fossil work, Dr. Shubin also studies embryos and genes uh, to understand how morphology is regulated. And as you'll hear from Dr. Shubin today, uh, the fusion of these very different research disciplines, paleontology and developmental biology, has proven to be an incredibly powerful combination for understanding how, animal, or how anatomical changes arise. Dr. Shubin is currently the Robert R. Bensley Distinguished Service Professor of Anatomy at the University of Chicago, and is the author of three books, Your Inner Fish, The Universe Within, uh, and most recently, Some Assembly Required. In addition, uh, he served as the presenter and scientific advisor for the Emmy Award-winning PBS miniseries, Your Inner Fish, and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, the California Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Uh, he is also a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and just before I turn this over, I just wanted to mention that during the seminar, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A and we will do our best to get to your questions at the end of the seminar. Uh, and with that, I will turn things over to Neil. Thank you, Doug, and uh, thank you uh, to the University of Georgia for inviting me and giving me the honor uh, to be the Boyd Lecturer this year. Uh, it's, a, it's a true honor. And one of the charges of the lecture was to talk a little bit about communicating genetics and development and anatomy in my research to a general community. And so that's why, let me share my screen. Give me a sec to get the, my act together here. Um, that's why I've called the lecture, um, Finding Your Inner Fish. There's a subheading there. Because, I mean, that to me has been one of the main vehicles for me to talk about discovery in science. So inner fish, this whole concept of inner fish turned into a book and a TV show. And the whole aspiration behind it was to fold a lot of research from paleontology to anatomy, to genetics and genomics and, and developmental biology, developmental evolutionary biology into a popular or hopefully popular <laughs> vehicle to tell the stories about science and how science is done. And the whole conceit of the whole thing is, to, is the idea that in every organ, in every tissue, in every cell, in every gene of our body, we contain up to billions of years of the history of life. And the way that, so we contain all these artifacts of the history of life. And um, the way we know this is by making discoveries in the fossil record making discoveries of genetics and embryos and so forth. And that's kind of the story I want to tell today with, in light of my own research. Um, so but the, the story actually begins for me in graduate school. Um, I uh, was a second year graduate student and I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do for a PhD dissertation. I entered graduate school wanting to study <clears throat> fossil mammals. I was training to be a paleontologist. Um, and I, I entered um, graduate school to study fossil mammals and I took a course on evolutionary biology, you know, sort of the great transitions in evolution, uh, taught by a, a paleontologist uh, that every week focused on a different transition in, in evolution. And in like week three or something like that, he showed this exact slide. This is the slide that launched my career. Um, this is a slide of the transition of what we knew about at the time uh, in cartoon form of the transition from fish to land living animal, from fish to tetrapod. I remember looking at this slide thinking, how did fish evolve to walk? 
that's a first class scientific problem. I mean, so much has to change, you know, the, the anatomy, the physiology, you name it. You know, you look at the fish on top, that's a cartoon of a, a, what's a lobe fin fish, a fossil lobe fin fish from rocks about 390 million years old. And on the bottom is an early limbed animal, an early tetrapod. That's a cartoon of a fossil from rocks about 365 million years old. I remember looking at that thinking, boy, that really is a great problem. You know, finding fossils that are intermediate between fish and land living animal. But soon it became much more to me because the whole molecular revolution hit. There was discoveries in genetics to show that there's a basic toolkit that builds bodies in, in animals as different as flies, worms, fish, and people. And maybe that could provide access to. So much of my um, research program has really been looking at embryos and looking at adults. That is, we can use molecular techniques to ask how are genes turned on and off? And how do genes interact with one another to build an embryo from you know, one cell to, to an adult? But importantly, we can go out, <coughs> excuse me, we can go out into the world. And if we know how to look, we could find intermediates between fish and tetrapod. See, I was training to be one of the people on the right, finding a fossil, transitional creature. Um, and eventually in my career, I realized I needed to be also somebody like who does stuff on the left, which does a lot of genetics, all geared toward answering the question, how did fish evolve to walk on land? Okay, so I started, as, so we're gonna start like I did as a paleontologist to talk about how we discover the transitional creature. And then we're in the, the remainder of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about genetics and development and, and, and ask, you know, what, is, what does it show us? Okay, so let's say you are a paleontologist and you're interested in this transition from life in water to life on land. And you wanna find new fossils that tell us about that, that bridge this gap. What do you do? Well, you look for places in the world that have three things. You look for places in the world that have rocks of the right age to answer the question that interests you. So remember I told you like that fish in the previous diagrams from like rocks about 390 million years old, their early limbed animal, the tetrapod from rocks about 365. So you wanna be in that time period, that window of time, which we call the late Devonian. So rocks of the right age. And the good news is geologists around the world have mapped the ages of rocks um, in different parts of the world. So, you know, looking at the geological record and the journals, you can get that. The next thing is, is you look for places in the world that have not only have rocks of the right age, but rocks of the right type to hold fossils. You know, rocks that were formed in the environments that they likely lived in, like here, like rivers and streams and lakes, maybe near shore tidal environments, um, uh, but also rocks that would hold fossils. You know, not every rock does, right? Some will like are too superheated and will you know, melt them. And some are metamorphic and high pressure. You know, so you need rocks that will, that where the fossils likely lived, but also um, that will preserve them. Finally, it does me no good if my rocks of the right age and the right type are buried, you know, 12 miles underground, right? They have to be accessible. So, you know, we go for that and we go for accessibility, exposures of the surface. That's it, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the trade secret, you know, the secret sauce, ingredient X, you know, to find uh, an intermediate, uh, an important intermediate fossil. Um, look for places in the world that are rocks that are at age, rocks that are at type, and rocks that are it's exposed to the surface. It soon became clear to me and my team, <coughs> the folks I was collaborating with, that this kind of environment preserved in the rock record would increase our odds of success if we focused on places in the world that had ancient delta systems. Now this is a map uh, actually of Pennsylvania and what it looked like in the Devonian era 365 million years ago. But you know, basically what you do is you look for places that are like the Amazon Delta today. And the reason why is if you have the right exposures of the right age of this environment, you can sample ancient estuaries, see where my uh, mouse is pointer, ancient rivers and streams, even ancient lakes and ponds. It's kind of perfect. It's kind of one-stop shopping for the relevant environments, you know? So rocks of the right age and then rocks from this kind of environment. That was kind of the insight that was really critical for us. So we hunted in the geological literature um, around the world um, to find where the best rocks of this type of the right age uh, were exposed to the surface. Remember my third, uh, my third variable. Well, a lot of hunting and a lot of work took us in the mid to late 1990s to what's called Nunavut Territory of Canada. What do you see here? Well, what you see here is up on the upper left, you see in the inset, you see Nunavut Territory of Canada. 
And there's the flag, a nice little flag with a nukshuk. But there you see circled in red in the upper left here where my pointer is, hopefully you can see my mouse, um, are the islands of Arctic Canada. That's kind of the area. Now zoom into the main body of the slide. What you see are the islands zoomed into those islands. You can see on the right here, Ellesmere Island. So in the middle, you can see Melville Island. Circled in red are areas where the Canadian Geological Survey showed that rocks of the right age formed in those ancient delta systems are exposed to the surface in the Canadian Arctic. This was the breakthrough. We realized <clears throat> we had rocks of the right type in the right age, likely exposed to the surface in a vast part of the world, an unexplored part of the world uh, in, the, in, the, in this Nunavut territory. Look all the way at the left here in my slide. And that scale says 100 kilometers. So you can see just how vast it is. On the right of the slide, you see what's called a stratigraphic column, which shows the ages of the rocks. And we're kind of in the right. We're in this, this thing called the Fram Formation, F-R-A-M. You might be seeing a bit of see it here. It's in the right time period. So there's a long way of saying rocks of the right age, rocks of the right type, rocks that expose to the surface in a vast area across the Canadian Arctic. So we set off on a long-term project to try to just search this area for, you know, for let's say a, like a flat-headed fish with fins, with arm bones inside, something like that, an intermediate. So we started in 1999, and this is kind of what our first camps looked like in 1999. We started to see the red arrow there on the map. We started in the western part of the Arctic. And what you see here is you can see our tents, right? So each of us has our own sort of mountaineering tent. We live in those. When you will build a wind wall around those things, they can withstand um, winds of about uh, 60 to 80 miles an hour. In the, um, that white tent there, <laughs> it was a disaster. Uh, we, in that first year, there's our kitchen tent, science tent. Uh, it didn't withstand winds of 25 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour. So you live and learn, right? But anyway, so that's kind of what it is. But the reason why I'm showing this to you is number one is you can drink the waters right out of the melting glaciers, great place to work. It's daylight 24 hours a day. Um, so it's a very different environment. But on the left, you could see the rocks we worked on in the Canadian Arctic in say 1999. This is our first season. What do you notice? Pretty flat. Yeah, it wasn't so good. Um, number two is there were fossils that we'd find on the surface. So you'd walk around and there's this freeze thaw that goes on in the Canadian Arctic and we would um, find fossils on the surface, but we were finding deep water fossils, fossils like fossil sharks and fish, fossil fish that lived in the middle of the ocean. That's not gonna be a place you're gonna find, you know, the earliest creatures to walk on land or a transitional creature, like a flat-headed fish with fins. So we uh, retooled. So we went home, licked our wounds, but we learned a lot. So we realized, so let's take our diagram here. We were in the middle of the blue, the, the sea. We needed to go in the ancient world upstream, right? And that meant, you know, going in, in the Arctic, going east. <coughs> so we went east. And this is 2000. You can see where the arrow is. We're now in southern Ellesmere Island. Uh, you should note that we have a new, uh, new kitchen tent <laughs> right there. So that one didn't blow away as much, although it did blow away a little bit. But look across the fjord here. This is um, up in um, about 79 north latitude. So you're up, you know, where it's 24 hours daylight a day in the summer. And polar bears actually are out in this fjord, um, which is a bit exciting. But what you see here in the, um, in, the, uh, in the cliffs in the distance, those are Devonian age rocks, 375 million years old, formed in ancient streams. These were perfect. So as soon as we got to here, got to this place, we started to find bits and pieces of the kind of fish we were looking for. These were bits of jaws, bits of arm bones, things like that of some of these fish. Not whole skeletons, but we were getting in the right game. So we needed a different place. We needed a place that had these rocks, but that had them that where they were, um, they would expose whole skeletons. The reason why there were bits and pieces of bones here is these were big streams. And the water was flowing very fast back in the Devonian. It would break up fossils as they, you know, critters as they died. And so we were finding bits and pieces. We need smaller streams. So we found a different valley right here. Um, this is the valley where really it all happened. This is the site that it worked out for us. This is, um, uh, you can see the valley here. We can't, the camp is about a mile from this, but you can see in the center, there's a big hole. That's a hole where we found a layer of fossil fish in small, formed in small streams. All right, so they all died in this like small streams. Um, and that layer contains skeleton after skeleton of fossil fish piled one on top of the other. Right in the right time and the right rocks. And so we decided to spend a couple summers uh, working this and that we did. 
And so we were pulling out all kinds of fossils out of this, you know, skeletons, but nothing I'd be here you know, talking to you about today. Everything changed pretty much two days before this particular slide was taken. This slide shows exactly what we were looking for. Um, so what you're seeing is two paleontologists on either side of this. This thing's being etched out because we had found it a few days before. In the front, so I'm gonna, you, know, you have to train your eyes as a paleontologist. So we're gonna do this as a little test for you. Um, see if you can see the fossil here. What you're looking for is, see everything is red or mud brown, right? Brownish red. What you're looking for here, and you have, we've trained our eye for a number of years for this moment, um, is what you're looking for is not different color, but different shape. Look for something that doesn't have the shape of the fractured rock. Spend a second. And if you look really carefully, what you'll see at the front here is a V. See, one thing and another, where the arrow is, this V. Underneath it were a series of teeth. It turned out that's a jopside down skull of a flat-headed fish, which is exactly what we we're looking for. So we removed this from the rocks, covered it with plaster, and then we, you know, we actually found, since have found about 20 more, that year we found about four. Um, comes back and, you know, to Chicago and Pennsylvania at the bottom of the helicopter. And this, after, um, uh, I'd say five or six months of preparation, where you can see on the right, a fossil prepared to remove the rock grain by grain. What you see is, looks like that specimen, this is that specimen, um, had uh, a skull, you're looking at the top of the skull, See one eye hole or orbit here, another eye hole or orbit here, right, boom, boom, on top. So you're looking at the top surface of the skull. Look at this, after another five months, check it out. Flat-headed fish, eyes on top. Look, it has a shoulder bone there, another shoulder bone next. It looks like it has a neck, no fish has a neck. So remember, what were we looking for? <clears throat> There's fish on top with a conical head and fins and no neck. Critter on the bottom, early limbed animal with limbs a neck and a flat head, we had found a flat-headed fish with fins, with a neck, a true intermediate. So what you see here is Tiktaalik rosea. Oh, and this is it here, brought it right here. This is a cast of it here. So the thing we first saw was this V right there. Um, <coughs> excuse me, that's a cast, not an original. You can see it has scales in its back like a fin. In the, in the foreground, you can see a fin with uh, fin webbing right there with fin rays. But look, like an early limbed animal, it has a flat head, eyes on top. The bones actually compare very well between fish and limbed animal. Um, it, has a, uh, it has a neck. And guess what? When we cracked open the fin, we found bones that correspond to upper arm, forearm, even parts of a wrist uh, and digits. Pretty, pretty clear what we were looking for. Well, needless to say, we were jumping down a lot. But this is after like you know, six years in the field and six summers in the field and two years in the lab. So basically when you put it on a phylogeny or an evolutionary tree, what you have is this, and now we filled it out, the field has filled it out with many more specimens here. So it's, this is just an old version of it. Just to show you though, you could see the transition from a fish-like creature on the bottom, this creature called Eustinopteron, long name there, but it goes, you know, you can follow the phylogeny all the way up to a limbed animal. These creatures are known as Acanthostega nictheostega. This critter Tiktaalik is the closest relative of those. You know, and the, the important point for communication is you can design fossil expeditions to find intermediates if you follow the simple rules, look for rocks of the right age, rocks the right type, rocks are exposed to surface, and uh, spend uh, a lot of time and a lot of failure and a lot of sprained ankles, <laughs> and you, you can get that sort of thing. You know, so this creature, Tiktaalik rosea, is an animal that has, you know, fins um, that contain limb bones inside. It has a neck, um, it has a wrist, it has lungs and has gills. Lungs are already present in these, in these creatures. So it's a true intermediate. It's a creature living mostly in water. Um, you know, and one thing, you know, when I was thinking about your inner fish is, okay, well this, you know, transition from life in water to life on land is really great and cool. But what's, what's even cooler is not just that it happened, but that it's part of our own history. It's part of our own bodies. So this neck we see for the first time in Tiktaalik and its evolutionary cousins living in the Devonian. This wrist we see for the first time in, in Tiktaalik and its cousins living in the Devonian. This is something that's to become our neck. This is something that's to become our wrist. So every time you bend your wrist, every time you shake your head, you can thank fish like these evolving in Devonian ecosystems 375 million years ago in that window of time. And how do we know that? 
We know that because we have other fossils we can and comparative anatomy. We can trace these. You can trace the humerus, the upper arm bone from Tiktaalik to amphibians, to reptiles, to other mammals, to people. You can trace the ulna and radius from Tiktaalik to amphibians, to reptiles, to creatures called reptiles, to mammals, to people, and on and on and on and on. And it's really a remarkable story, how we're connected to the rest of life on our planet. And we can see this as we find fossils. We can see this as we compare embryos of one species to another that are alive today. And we can see this as we um, look at genes and how they work uh, in, uh, in development. This changes how you see things. This changes how you see the human body, you know, when you start to fold in all these data. So you're looking at this individual here, Albert Einstein, and you're seeing a pinnacle of human achievement. When you're a fish guy like me, and you're looking at the comparisons of humans to fish, you don't see that, you just see a big fat bipedal fish, okay? And it helps to compare uh, Professor Einstein to the fish, you can do it you or me or anybody else, <clears throat> um, to the fish. Um, Einstein's on the left, by the way, I labeled them so it's easier to, to, to see the difference. But if you, um, I know it's bad. Anyway, um, if you look at a human embryo, I just showed you the fossils, but if you look at a human embryo, you know, here's what a human head looks like a few weeks after conception, right? What you have is, this is just the head, and you're looking at what's called the ventral or undersurface of it. You, know, you can see paired primordia for the eyes on the top, this stuff will become the eyes. And then you can see what I color coded here are a series of swellings in the so-called pharyngeal, reading, uh, pharyngeal uh, region. Um, these swellings are paired. You can see I've color coded light blue, dark blue, green, and yellow. And they have little clefts between them. And there are cells inside there that are gonna do all kinds of stuff as I'll show you in a second. Well, guess what? Fish have this too. Here's a shark, doesn't look identical, but it has this, this arrangement. Paired primordia for the eyes. And then these paired swellings, uh, light blue, dark blue, uh, green, and yellow with the, the, the slits between them. <clears throat> well, look, you know, there's cells inside there. We can mark those cells and see what they become in development. <coughs> and if you look, in the shark, the light blue becomes portions of the upper and lower jaw, right? You can trace those cells and that's what they become. You can look at the other ones and guess what they become? They become portions of the gill apparatus. The, 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 the skeleton, the muscles, the arteries, and the nerves. They all have that basic organization. Well, what happens in people and other mammals? Well, we have those swellings too. You could trace those cells. In the light blue one, they become portions of the jaw and two little bones in the middle ear. The dark blue ones becomes a little part of a little throat bone called the hyoid, as well as one bone in the middle ear and some other stuff. And then the other two in green and yellow, you could trace them and they become portions of that throat bone, but also the voice box, as well as the muscles and nerves and bones that control all that stuff. So what does this mean? This means that many of the muscles and nerves and bones I'm using to talk to you with right now, and many of the muscles and bones and nerves you're using to hear me with right now, correspond to gill structures in fish. How do we know that? We can compare the development and the trajectory and what happens to those cells. We can look at the DNA that controls the formation of these different regions and compare them between sharks and humans. And we can look at the fossil record and I can show you how a gill bone was transformed over time in a fish to an ear bone in human. Multiple lines of evidence pointing to the same sort of amazing story. So, I mean, the fossil record and the comparative record show us this deep time. So with one couple of lessons, you can predict and you can make an effort to find fossils, key intermediates. Um, but also when we link that to developmental data, we can begin to really see some deep comparisons. So what's development? You know, development, you know, you can begin as an embryo. There's a, we begin as a single cell, a fertilized egg, right? A single cell. But we're all around here, you know, and looking at our computers, um, you know, it's trillions of cells, probably up to 30 to 40 trillion of our own cells um, that are all packed in the right place. We call the process going from the single cell on the right to the trillion cell, you know, 30 trillion cell individual on, on the, I'm sorry, on the left, the embryo, on the right, the, the human, that creature on the right. We call that bodybuilding, right? Going from one cell to many all packed in the right way. That's the magic of developmental biology. Genes are being turned on and off as cells divide and make organs and tissues and so forth. And that interaction among different genes and tissues gives us a body from a single cell. And if we can compare 
sort of the recipe and processes that build the body of a human, you know, from egg to adult, and compare that to the recipe that builds the body of a fish or a, a frog or what have you, we can begin to see the similarities and differences uh, among them. And it's pretty darn remarkable. So let's talk a little bit about this. So I'm going to drill in for the next part of the talk on embryology to complement some of the <clears throat> fossil work we talked about before. Now remember, in each cell, each cell has DNA inside that's being turned on and off. And one of the amazing things about cells is, you know, you have about a six foot long strand of DNA inside the nucleus of every cell of your body. So if you say, you know, you have 30 trillion ish cells in the body, each one having about a six foot long strand of DNA packed inside. If you're to unwrap all that stuff and put it all end to end from all trillions of cells, the DNA in your body, if we unwrapped it and put it end to end, would go from here to Pluto. That is truly amazing. That's an enormous amount of genetic computational power inside. Furthermore, the DNA is all wrapped in the right, all wrapped up on itself to get into the nucleus, that six foot long thing. And it opens and closes and changes shape. And as it does so, genes are turned on and off in a set of complex interactions. And it's those complex interactions of turning genes on and off, which control the development of cells, tissues, and ultimately organs. <clears throat> so we're gonna look a little bit at that uh, when we look at limbs, because that's what we're you know, talking about here. So here's, here's a human limb on the top. Okay, so we're gonna look at this from development and we're gonna try to find your inner fish in the, pro in the genes and, and so forth of, of development. So here's a human. And if you look at a limb here, you have three regions of the limb in red, yellow, which I've color coded in red, yellow, and blue, right? You have the upper arm bone, it's a single bone. We call that the stylopod. You have two bones in the forearm. We call that the zugopod, shown in yellow, the radius and ulna. And then you have the wrist and digits, this blue area, which is called the autopod. Now we can trace all this stuff in the fossil record. And yes, we can. We could find that if we look in the late of the latest part of the Devonian, what we find are fossils that kind of look like fish uh, that have this stylopod, zugopod, and autopod, red, um, red, yellow, and blue, already set up in ancient amphibians that you find in the fossil record. This one from Greenland. So when we look at Tiktaalik, the creature we found, well, guess what? It's a fish. So you can tell it's a fish. Look to see it as fin rubbing, all right? So it has fin rubbing shown in sort of the gray, the, the, the lines that you see extending there. But it also has the one bone, the red, the two bones, the yellow, and it has a whole bunch of bones that lie at the terminal end shown in blue, which compared to the autopod. These, some of these compare directly to the wrists and digits uh, of tetrapod. So we can make that comparison as we go back. We can find the assembly of these three regions. And if I was to add even more fossils, you know, below Tiktaalik, you'd be, begin to see how the, the arm bone was assembled anatomically in the fossil record. But if we look at a lot of living fish, here's a zebrafish. This is a very common model organism. It's a living fish today, tiny little thing um, that a lot of people use for genetics and developmental um, work. If you look at that and try to compare it to Tiktaalik, the tetrapod, and a human, or any of the other fossils, which I didn't include, but I could have put them there. What you find are substantial differences, right? What you find is, look at it, it has, all, has a lot of fin webbing, right? It's shown in light gray there. And in black, these are bones formed out of cartilage, but there's no stylopod, zugopod, and autopod that's obvious to compare. So how do you do this? Where is your inner fish in living fish? Or in humans, for that matter. So when you're comparing things like this, comparing a human on the right to say, a living fish like a zebrafish on the left, what we, we're left doing is comparing how they develop. Remember I told you going from one cell, you know, uh, fertilized egg to trillions of cells, we can look at the development of these structures and compare the development of a fin to the development of the limb. We can compare how genes are turned on and off in the development of the fin and compare them to the development um, of a limb. Now what happens here is in both cases, <coughs> what you find is, the limb, the, the fin or the limb develops as a little bud that sticks out of the body. Okay, that's kind of common to both. Then what happens inside is very different, right, in, in, in many ways. So what we wanted to do is we, we, were, we were guided into this by some discoveries made by colleagues in the last couple of decades, which are truly amazing. So we're going to look at a set of genes. They're called Hox13 genes. There are actually a couple different flavors of them in the chromosomes. Um, there's, there's actually four different versions of these genes. Two of them are active. Two of these Hox13 genes 
are active in limbs, but I'm not going to give you the names from now unless you want them in the Q&A. What you see here is Hox13 genes, and you see on the left, this is the limb bud of a mouse, okay? And what you can see by this stage in the limb bud, it's developed a little bit and it's formed this little paddle out here. You see the paddle? You know, you can begin to see little swellings where the digits might even form. And on the right, shown in blue, is labeled for the labeled cartilages, is a, uh, is a mouse that's actually um, developed a bit and all the bones have developed, okay? So you're going from embryo, limb bud on the left, to developed limb on the right. And what you see here shown in black on the left is where the Hox genes, Hox13 genes are turned on. This is a, this is a probe that, was, that it turns black to show where, the, where that gene is active. And what you should immediately notice is in early development, the Hox13 genes are active in the terminal end where the digits and wrists will form. Now, a number of really important experiments were done um, starting <coughs> excuse me, in the 1990s to the present day where people said, okay, can we trace where these Hox13 cells, the ones that had Hox13 activity, can we trace where they end up in the embryo? And what happens if we make a mouse that doesn't have these genes? So in the first experiment, they traced these cells that had Hox13 activity all the way to the, um, to, an, to, um, to the adult. And look at it, shown in green with only a little strand of some tendons in the, in the, in the, in the proximal end of the limb. Look, they almost perfectly mark the wrist and digit area. So this gene is active in the wrist and digit area and the cells that, um, that had activity actually come to life where the wrists and digits, the fingers are. Now, what happens if you make a mouse lacking these genes or lacking their activity uh, in limbs? I think you could probably guess it. If some scientists in um, France and also in Utah engineered what are called gene knockouts, they made a mouse that lacked these genes in their activity in the limbs. And guess what? Not only do these genes mark the cells that make the, um, the wrists and digits, when you make a mouse lacking them in the limbs, guess what they're missing? They have the humerus, the stylopod. They have the zygopod, the radius and ulna, but guess, well, look what's missing. It's not random. They're missing the wrists and digits. So these genes are perfect markers in many ways uh, and are necessary <coughs> for the formation of the wrists and digits. So we asked a question, my lab said, that's great. Well, this is the question we always ask in my lab. Okay, so what about fish? We know fish have these genes. What are they doing? Can we do similar experiments in fish? If so, what's the corresponding structure of wrists and digits in fish? What happens? All right, so enter some work. And this is the, um, this is the situation in mouse. So it's the start, the start of these experiments. So it's looking at these gene activity, the activity of these genes and the embryos. And this is the mouse. Remember I showed you, here's the paddle shown in black. This is where the Hox13 genes are active, shown in black. And you can see they, they're in that paddle area, which is going to form wrists and digits. So as a first experiment, we said, okay, where are these genes active in fish fins? And it turns out they're active, shown in dark blue here, in the terminal end of the fish fin. Okay, so it does seem that there's some correspondence between the terminal end of a mouse, which forms the wrist and digits, and the terminal end of a fish fin. Then a graduate student entered my lab, this is Andrew Gurka, who's now doing a postdoc at Harvard. He attempted to repeat the cell lineage experiment that was done in mouse. Remember the one that had the green that marked the wrists and digits so perfectly as they mapped those cells as they went from embryo to adult. He did those same experiments using some, this took a couple of years, honestly, um, to, get them, uh, to get this to work. Uh, but he marked it and he looked, here's a fish fin and you can see the, the, the cells in blue, but the labeled cells, the Hox, the cells that have that Hox 13 activity, look at them, they're at the terminal end of the fin, six days after fertilization. Those cells then go on to form the fin webbing 21 days after. So if you look at this, what's the car, when you look at this experiment that was done in mice, where these cells that had Hox activity mark the um, wrists and digits, the equivalent area in fish fins, boom, the, um, the fin webbing. So you have your inner fish. It's the, um, the same genes are active in us. They're making the terminal end of a fish uh, and, and the mouse and, and also a human. Okay, what happens if we knock out the genes? What happens if we like make an embryo that doesn't have them? So that took a postdoc in my lab, Tetsuya Nakamura, who's now on the faculty of Rutgers University. This is Tet in uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. We have a connection with them at the University of Chicago. 
So what he used was at the time, this is in 2013, 2014, was CRISPR-Cas genome editing. Long way of saying in this slide, so those of you who aren't, uh, don't do this kind of thing. Basically, he was able to make mice where these genes were inactive, knock them out. Okay, that's what he did. So, and then he, he did those and he let them develop. Unfortunately, they survived. And then he popped them in our CT scanner that we use for fossils. Um, but he was able to see what happened as he did that experiment. And to make a very long story short, um, and the top is a normal wild type zebrafish fin. Fin rays, you can see them sticking out there. And in dark are the bones that lie you know, in the base of the fin formed out of cartilage. When he made um, fish that didn't have them, guess what? They're missing much of the fin rays. So when we repeat the experiments, see the mouse on top and they do the cell lineage and, the, um, and knock the genes out, we could do those same experiments in fish and compare what to compare. Uh, we could see that when you do the cell lineage, you map the fin rays. When you knock them out, you lose the fin rays. It seems that the cells that make the fin rays in fish are equivalent to the cells that make our wrists and digits. So if you ask and you look at these things, you could say, well, there's nothing really here to compare. They look so different. Um, but when you do the molecular comparison, you find that cells that make the terminal end of our limbs and mice, um, the wrists and digits, make the, um, make the, uh, the fin rays of fish. Now I'm going to take a little detour for the geneticists in the audience. So if you don't know genetics, don't panic. This is, I'm going to show you your inner fish too, which is going to be a little more technical for the next two slides, next three slides. Um, so what you see here is the Hox genes lie in a chromosome. <laughs> and that's where these black boxes are. On either side are the so-called regulatory elements shown on green and, and orange. And these are regions that control the activity of the Hox genes in the embryo. Turns out when people looked at, the, at mice, they found that on one side of the Hox, the coding region of the Hox genes, there are these regulatory enhancers, which drive the activity to make the stylopod and zeugopod. On the other side are the ones that drive the activity of these genes to make the wrists and digits. So again, just like I showed you before, even if you don't understand regulatory evolution, you kind of know we're looking for your inner fish here. We're asking a question. We know fish have the, um, uh, the Hox genes and they lie on the chromosome in the same way. Do they have these control elements that control their activity, particularly the ones that make wrists and digits? If so, what are they doing in, in, uh, in fish? Okay, the next slide is gonna be kind of complicated, but the end result is the same. The answer is they do have these genes and the answer is also we can swap the genes between a fish and a mouse and the mouse and a fish and they work the same. So here you have um, for the aficionados, you have the Hox coding region here where my pointer is, the Hox D region. You have the green enhancers here. And by the way, we can take the, we can take the, um, the um, elements from a, from a fish and put them in a mouse and we can compare them to the natural situation in a mouse and we can find out it's identical. Furthermore, these, these regions drive activity in a normal fin. And likewise, we can do it. These yellow things are the enhancers that drive activity in the wrists and digits. Turns out fish have them as well. We could take the fish version and put them in a mouse and it works very fine. And we can take the mouse and put them in a fish and it works fine as well. And they have normal activity. This complicated slide is a long way of saying that for over 400 million years of evolution, we have the same genes patterning our, the terminal end of our fins, uh, terminal end of fins and limbs, and that the regions that control their activity are so shared that they can, we can swap their activity between mice uh, and fish. There are, some, there are differences, but there are not many. Okay, to talk a little bit, and I'll close, talk a little bit about what we're doing now. It's been a couple of minutes, and then we'll take your questions. Um, so we're continuing with the developmental work. Obviously, that's a big part of my lab. And then, then the latest um, expeditions have been to Antarctica. We haven't been able to go for obvious reasons lately because of COVID. Um, but we've been working in these Devonian age rocks, rocks of the right age, a little bit older than what we uh, worked on in, um, in the Arctic. Um, along here, you see the in brown across the continent of Antarctica are the Transantarctic Mountains. We've been working in those. And over a number of years, we've been working two different sites. You can see where I said year one and year two. These are areas that have rocks in Antarctica that were formed in ancient delta systems uh, in rocks about 380, 385 million years old. Just to give you some sense, this is one of the most, it's such a privilege to work there. To give you a sense of what it looks like in some of these areas, mountains poke through the ice and they look like the Grand Canyon, only with glaciers. Check that out. This red rock is all Devonian age rock poking through the glaciers. In the distance is Maya Mountain. See, it looks like a Mayan temple. Um, 
And these rocks are kind of perfect to hold fossils. Um, this is, uh, it, it's a challenging place to work. Uh, this is, you know, this is camp. I, you know, I go to the, you know, get my coffee at, make coffee at six in the morning. This is kind of what it would look like. I took, snapped this in one morning. Some days just the tents would get buried over. But you get around with snowmobiles and we tootle around between these different, uh, different mountains poking through the ice, looking for, uh, looking for fossils in the Devonian age rocks. Isn't it amazing? We're finding fish fossils in Antarctica and these mountain ranges poking through the ice, you know. And it's kind of an amazing disconnect between present and past. This was New Year's Day a couple of years ago. My tent was all the way on the left. Um, but we can find, this gives you a sense of what we look for. In the foreground here, you see, you see the shales here. They're sort of green. But look in this shale here. You see something white? Yeah, that's a fish. And so we can find whole fish in these things. Indeed, here we can find whole pavements of fish. See it shown in yellow? That's an entire pavement of fish bones, which is truly remarkable. We're still trying to figure it out. We took that whole pavement home. It actually went well under where I'm standing and beyond. Um, but we're also finding early bony fish. So this is a fish from the Devonian known as Bothrolepis. It has a, um, a skeleton composed of bone that compares very much to ours. We find a lot of those up in Antarctica, but what's really remarkable is we find whole skeletons. This is a whole skeleton, but it doesn't look remarkable to you until you see it's a larva. We're finding fossil larva um, and developmental series <clears throat> in the shales in Antarctica. So stay tuned, we're still working on it. We're looking for a tectonic like relative, haven't found it yet, but hopefully uh, if we can get back there, we will. So I wanted to talk, you know, so the, the, the theme of today's um, lecture is, you know, not just communicating via your inner fish, but that science is indeed multidisciplinary, that the field of paleontology looking for fossil intermediates and the fossil record, which we can target rocks for, can merge very nicely with uh, em em embryology, genetics, genomics, uh, and so forth, to ask the question, how did the great transition in evolutions happen? And you know, when you think about it, it's something really profound. I love to communicate uh, to diverse audiences. That is, you can ask the question, like, who cares about your inner fish? But those of us in biomedical research, we know the answer to that. We know that Nobel Prizes in medicine or physiology have gone to people working on flies, on mice, you know, on yeast, on corn. You know, two Nobel Prizes awarded to you know, five people in the last 16 years have gone to folks working on Xenorhabditis elegans, a tiny little worm the size of a comma on the piece of paper. Yet that worm is telling us about how our, you know, our genes are, you know, how our cells are programmed to die naturally and what goes wrong in diseases like, um, diseases like cancer. Likewise, tells us what our genes are turned off. So I like to think that as we discover cures to everything that ails us, in, such as Alzheimer's to different cancers, that the breakthroughs that will extend and enrich our lives will in some way be based on flies, worms, and in some cases, even fish. I can't imagine a more profound uh, example of our, the importance of our evolutionary connection to the rest of life on our planet than that. Thank you very much. And I, just to close, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a whole ton of people who actually did the work. Um, my colleagues on the Tiktaalik project, my co-PIs, Ted Deschler and the late Farris Jenkins, uh, people from my laboratory who I mentioned today, others who I didn't, whose slides I showed, uh, funders, uh, just a lot of people who have collaborated with me and have been um, patient with me uh, over the years. <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks so much, Neil. That was great. Um, looks like we've got a few questions on, on various topics in the Q&A. And I'll, I'll just uh, start with the first one. There are a few related to paleontology and fossils. Uh, and so Amanda Greenway asks, how do you know how deep or far to carve out when you're when you find something? Yeah, good question. I'm always trying to solve that puzzle. Um, so basically, what we do is when we're doing so we we can't automate this process. I'd love to be able to do it. You know, if we had a scanner that I could take in the field that could blast through the rocks, of the, you know, ace. We have those for laboratory work, but you know, when you're working in the Arctic or Antarctic, power supply is important. Things are heavy. We can't really bring a lot of stuff up there. So what we do is, as I said earlier, look for places that have rocks at the surface. Then what we'll do is we'll chase those, I'm sorry, look for places that have the rocks in the surface, but have fossils in, in the rocks at the surface. So we'd find those fossils. And then we trace those fossils to see the layer that those things on the surface came from. And we dig in. So we always start with fossils and we follow the fossils. And so for instance, if I'm digging a layer, let's say we take it in five or 10 feet. <clears throat> um, if we all of a sudden run out of bone, 
You know, it, mean, it might mean we ran out of bone in that lens and that we can stop, or maybe it's just the bone stopped for a while and it'll pick up again. So typically what we'll do is we'll take it in another few feet and then just stop until it gets too hard. So it's kind of like mining an ore. You know, you're mining it until it runs out. And so I don't have any hard and fast rules. I do know that in some places it's really hard to quarry the rock, right? So up where the Tiktaalik site was, we'd spend about a week or two just, you know, just with chisels and hammers and stuff, just removing rock as best as, as much as we can. And the reason why we stopped digging there is we hit a wall, literally hit the end of a cliff. And so for us to take that, to follow the Tiktaalik site would require heavy equipment. You know, so if somebody wants to find more tectolics, they're certainly there. The layer is still there, but they need to bring heavy equipment in. We didn't have the funding or the, the approval to do that. Great. So um, Michael, Michael Tazaris said that you're interested in this transition of walking on land. What do you think is the um, biggest unknown transition that could still be out there for a graduate student or a UGA undergraduate to, to look at? Awesome question. I love questions like that. Um, the one that really captures my interests from a developmental and paleontological um, level is one that there are people making some breakthroughs now, but I think there's a ton more to do, and that's the origin of vertebrates. The origin of creatures with our kind of skeleton, the origin of creatures with a cell type called the neural crest, which does all kinds of cool stuff in development, the origin of creature with our kind of um, nervous system and, and nerves in our head, with jaws like ours that came about later. I think there's, if I had to choose an area where, I think I might do it one day, I, you know, once this COVID thing's over and, and I can get beyond this bonian thing, but it's a great problem because when you go from a, an invertebrate chordate, kind of like a worm, like a creature known as like amphioxus or tunicates or things like that, which don't have backbones um, or nervous systems entirely like ours to all of a sudden a fish, like a jawless fish or something else, you're, you have all kinds of new tissues that have come about, bone and teeth and uh, you know, countless other tissues. You know, so I think it's a problem, number one, that new fossils, if somebody wanted to look in rocks about mm, 500 million years old, maybe a little bit younger than that, uh, formed in near shore environments, there'd be cool things to do. Um, but also on the developmental side, um, there, there are folks working on this, but there's so much more to do in asking how these new cell types arose. So there's a genetic part asking the origin of new cell types, and there's a uh, sort of paleontological anatomical part, you know, how did these structures come about anatomically in the fossil record? <clears throat> so Anna Yushmanoff has a question related to, to uh, one of your slides that mentioned GAR, where you were testing GAR enhancers. So why GAR instead of some other fish? Oh, simply put, GAR is a better human than zebrafish are. All right? And the reason why is um, zebrafish, I think I told you uh, at one point when the graduate student meeting, zebrafish have duplicated out almost every single gene. They have a, what's called a whole genome duplication. So in zebrafish, for whatever reason, we don't know the exact reason why, but many modern fish have duplicate genes of everything. So instead of having one hox, say D gene, they have two, or I mean, sorry, one hox A gene, they have two, you know, and others like that. And so um, or, and so it's more complicated genomically to work on creatures that have duplicated genomes, but GAR don't have that duplication. So GAR much so, if you look at the overall genome of a GAR and compare it to a mouse and a human, it's much more similar in a lot of ways than it is a zebrafish. So we end up using a GAR and zebrafish quite a bit back and forth because one is easier to manipulate in the lab because we can get embryos and they're kind of easy to work with. But, but they're kind of be hard to compare when you have two versions of every gene rather than one. Whereas in GAR, we can, you know, you have the one-to-one -one comparison, which is often a lot easier. So that's why GAR is often, sometimes better. We swap them in and out. So Yuan C has another science question for you. Uh, is it possible to get DNA from samples uh, that, of, of your age? I so wish we could, that'd be so awesome. But sadly, the answer is no. Um, you know, when you're dealing with, <laughs> I think the oldest sample that they've gotten is not quite a million years. You know, it's on the, um, if you're getting a million years in, um, in ancient DNA, you're doing really well. Or maybe in the order of hundreds of thousands of years, we're dealing with 375 million years. So you think about what happened in that point, by the time you find, say, tectonic bones, by the way, this is the V we saw originally, right there. Um, 
you know, it's been 375 million years sitting in the rock and waters have been percolating through, you know, and you've had deformation and, and all kinds of things. So it's kind of, it's unlikely that you'll have nucleotides. And there've been some claims, not of rocks as old as, DNA in rocks as old as Tiktaalik, but somewhere around. It almost invariably turns out to be contamination. Uh, so we have another Tiktaalik related question from Sarah Jansi. A uh, fascinating talk, is Tiktaalik in Inuktut a uh, word? If so, what does it mean? P.S. Thank you for showing the Nunavut flag. Yeah, so it's a Nuktuk. Um, the, um, so what happened is when we discovered Tiktaalik, we knew we had to come up with a new generic name for it, right? Because it's part of like describing it. So what we did is um, we had engaged the Inuit community early on in our project because we're about 300 miles from an Inuit settlement known as Grease Fjord, has about 175 people in a town. They live like 80 north, whole families, um, imagine. And so we would typically take a, uh, like a youth or a 16 year old on our expedition from the village uh, and work with the school and try to engage them as much as possible. They were very interested in it. Um, so when we found Tiktaalik, we consulted with the Inuit elders for a name and that's kind of how it is. So we basically met with the elders um, and told them what the fossil was like, uh, what it was, what it's important was, and they understood all that. And then um, they, uh, we asked them, you know, come up with a name that's meaningful to you uh, and then one we can pronounce. Cause obviously, I mean, they, they, they have many consonants we can't pronounce. Um, so Tiktaalik, as they say, Tiktaalik uh, was, um, was uh, the name because it means freshwater fish in their language. So when they looked at it, they said, oh, that's like a freshwater fish that will hunt called a burbot. They hunt a kind of burbot in the Western part of the Arctic and they call it a, tiktaal a Tiktaalik. And so we worked with them and we made Tiktaalik because of the longer A is a little easier to say. And then um, that was totally cool with them. And then they were, they were, they, it was basically referred to freshwater fish in their language. Now, as another example, I'll tell you, I'll give you a hot tip. So during the lock, so uh, last February, we collected rocks from the Arctic uh, in 2006 that we brought home. And, and the reason why we brought them home and didn't prepare them is they had a couple scales that looked like tiktaalik scales on the surface. And, um, you know, we couldn't prepare them because they're, you know, it's, it's a block, it's a thick sandstone block. So what we did is we put that block in the CT scanner last December uh, and scanned it. And guess what we found inside? a small version, like a third the size of Tiktaalik, about a foot and a half long. And there's a fin inside it has, it's the same, but different. It's clearly a new genus. So as part of that, we're doing a new naming project. And this name, we're not working with the elders, we're working with the school kids in that school in Grace Fjord, um, which has about 15 kids ranging from preschool to high school and um, sending them pictures and they're gonna generate a name. And they're, they're gonna generate a list of names and we'll choose one. Uh, but so we, this one we're doing with the youth. So, and we'll announce that one. You'll probably hear about this fossil uh, over the summer, I would imagine, if everything goes as we plan. But nothing ever does go as we plan, so it may be fall. <laughs> so. <coughs> so we have a couple of questions about your field sites, including one from uh, former U, uh, U Chicago uh, graduate Jackie Mohan, another one from Dorset Trapnell. Um, can't you find more comfortable places to work than uh, <laughs> in Arctic and Antarctic? Yeah, there are. Um, so there are places. So the um, Nevada is another place that um, is really good that we'd like to work at some point. Um, there's central southeastern Turkey is another place that would be ideal. Afghanistan, Iran has a lot of um, has a lot of Devonian, but we'll give that a miss for a little bit. Um, so there are places that do have Devonian rock formed in ancient deltas. Turns out the polar regions are the least worked. So if you want a place where kind of nobody has done anything but the geology, really not look for fossils, it turns out that these polar regions are sort of ideal to make some new discoveries um, in a lot of ways. Furthermore, um, over the years, my team and I have actually gotten the toolkit really to kind of to work in the regions. We kind of, it takes a little bit of know-how, you know, and we've generated that know-how the hard way, you know, starting in the 1990s. Um, and so it was a sort of a natural extension for us to think about working in Antarctica, but certainly Nevada. We work in Pennsylvania as well, which is, uh, there's, so there's that kind of Devonian rock all the way down from Southern New York State to into West Virginia. So we put her around there and usually in the fall, because there's a lot of like shrubs and ticks and things like that. So usually in the fall, we'll, we'll head down there. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd love to go to Hawaii, but you know, that's all volcanic and recent. So I won't find any Devonian there. 
so um, we have on, a, on another topic, topic of science literacy, we have a question from Holly Ammerman. Uh, Dr. Schumann, as a PhD student in science education, we talk about science literacy all the time. As respected scientists who work with explaining a difficult topic, evolution to the masses, how do you define science literacy? And what advice do you have for K through 12 science educators and those that work with them when trying to teach evolution? Yeah, so, so science literacy. So, the, um, so I would say somebody is science literate if they're not intimidated by science and know, have the tools to follow up on their curiosity. So there's no way in, you know, that you can give everybody the full on encyclopedic knowledge of science literacy. But science literacy means not being intimidated by it and having the tools to be able to follow your own curiosity, whether it's something in the news or whether it's something that you read about. So the tools to, to uncover you know, science as much as understand that. Now, the kind, of ins the kind of things I use to sort of, and everybody's different, everybody has their own bag of, you know, I won't call them tricks, but bag of tools, um, their toolkit. Uh, for me, you know, I think one step in science literacy is to engage people and to enthuse them, to ignite their interests. And so by igniting interests, if somebody's interested in a subject, they're less likely to be intimidated by it. You know, we're dealing sometimes in our culture with people who are not only intimidated by science, but they're hostile to it for whatever reason, you know, maybe cultural reasons and maybe, you know, how they've grown up or what have you, you know, so we have to overcome those things. And I think the best way to do that, at least with my attack I take, is to build enthusiasm, to inspire people. So part of it is inspiring, right? Because when you inspire somebody, they're less likely to, to be, you know, um, dissuaded by barriers. They're more likely to follow up on it itself and they're more likely to, uh, to, to, um, to, um, to, to learn beyond your own contact with them. So that's the first. And then the other is I like to convey when I'm conveying um, the basic principles of something with as, with as little jargon as possible. And it's not that jargon's not important, it is. There's a reason why we stick to it in our scientific papers because it's very precise and contains all kinds of information. But that can be a barrier as you try to communicate, right, those languages. So analogies, stories, narratives, things like that can often work better than, than jargon in providing long lasting uh, scientific retention and interest. So we have a technical question about the Hox genes. If you can swap these regulatory elements when different species, why did you not get uh, mice with, with fins and, and uh, fish with fingers? Yeah, so the, um, there are elements, regulatory elements that um, mice have that fish don't, that we weren't able to swap, that they, and so one of my colleagues in Spain actually put a version of a mouse uh, enhancer that the fish don't have, put one in a fish and actually got a little more growth on the terminal end. It didn't exactly have a limb back there, but it had more proliferation, more cell division uh, at the terminal end. So there is some of that going on, but yeah. But there are, but there, there are more similarities and differences. So what that's telling us is that if when you're looking at the, if you're, you wanna focus on the genes that are involved in the transition from fins to limbs, it's not gonna be the activity of Hox genes as much. It's gonna be things that are downstream of them that are, you know, that they turn on and off, you know, downstream. So we have uh, a couple of similar questions from uh, Jeb Byers and from Dorset Trapnell relating to what drove animals onto the land. What was the selective pressure that kind of yeah. induced that? <laughs> right, so think about it as a push-pull. So you're in the water and pretty much in the Devonian, every fish, except for some of the smallest, most armored ones are carnivores. Herbivory hasn't really been invented yet in the vertebrate record. So it's kind of a fishy fish world. So if you think about water, in the water, you had lots of predatory fish and you had lots of competitors. Whereas on land at this time, there were food sources, there were, in, there were insect like creatures, there were plants, but there were no competitors or predators. So if you think about any variant that will get you away from that sort of intense predatory and competitive environment, it's all low of food, it has its upsides, but anything that will get you away from that and into that area of more opportunity with fewer predators and competitors uh, would be selected for. So our branch of the tree of life didn't stay in the water to fight the battle, it, it left. For reasons both push and pull, right? So there's advantages to getting away from the fight, but there's also opportunity, you know, on, on land new opportunities that didn't exist before. So Carrie Pucko writes, we don't usually run across piles of dead animals. 
Why are there seemingly piles of dead fish or other animals that are all fossilized near each other? Yeah, so typically what you have, you will find them if you know where to look today. You know, so on the banks of streams after flooding events, there are certain eddies that will have like piles of dead fish or dead shells or so forth. So you will find lots of those if you know where to look. So what happened with um, the site that gave rise to Tiktaalik is it was a flooding event. You know, so you had a lot of creatures that were killed in a mass mortality event, like a mud flow, and it captured them all there and then buried them very quickly. And those you'll see today, they're definitely around. You just have to know where to look for them. Um, but these things were buried very quickly in a mass casualty event, as we call it, you know, so like a flooding event that spread a lot of mud. So that's why they're plastered one on top of the other, all akimbo inside. So we're hitting five o'clock. So I think just one more question uh, from Trigvi McDonald uh, asking, how did you distinguish the enhancer regions for fish, for the fish hawk's D gene, right? How, how can you? Oh yeah, so we did a couple of things with that. So we used DNA sequence comparisons of their sequences, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. Then we used a technique called attack seek. So attack seek is, this, is, a, is a technique that's become widely used in the last number of years where you can look to see where the chromatin is open. So where the chromatin is open, you're likely to have active enhancer regions. So we'd use that. We'd also use certain marks in the chromatin to find likely enhancer. So we'd basically make a pileup of similarity gene sequence. Um, uh, where these marks are would be in the chromatin for active chromatin and then where it would be open. And so you, from that, you'll get candidate enhancer regions, right? Then you could take them out, you cut them out and then you put them in a, what's called a reporter you, you know, attach a probe to them, a dye to them, pop them into zebrafish to see if they're active in the right way. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Shubin, for answering all of these questions, for a wonderful lecture, and uh, just taking the time to chat with us. Uh, it's my pleasure. What a, great, uh, what a great afternoon for me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, and thank all of you.